Hello all, before we begin this episode, I would just like to ask our listeners to like and subscribe to this channel as it will help us out. We are fairly new on YouTube and it would help us a lot if you did so. You can also comment if you prefer. Thank you. Welcome in the Great Khan's Tent. History, Literature and Storytelling in the Great Khan's Tent is now available on YouTube. You can find us using this podcast name. Fear not, listeners, episodes will still be released on this podcast first, and it is only after a delay of a week that I will upload them onto YouTube. You can still find us on all your podcast providers first. Are you interested in getting the book you just published reviewed? Writing some piece of literature and need help getting it out there and promoted? Interested in sharing what piece of literature we should cover next? Well, fret not. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on Patreon, where your contribution can help in growing this podcast. For as low as $3 a month, a price less than a good, and I mean good, cup of coffee, you can help contribute to the growth of this podcast. Every bit helps, but as always, it is not necessary to do so, but will be appreciated. Find the Patreon link on our website, on our social media accounts, or email us and we can send it to you. Thank you. If you have any suggestions, comments, or complaints, please be sure to email us at all lowercase in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. That is in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. We would love to hear from our listeners. Thank you for listening, and now on with the show. In this episode, we continue the story of Nuruddin and Anas al Jalis with Knight 37. As mentioned before, we once again encounter the three historical characters Harun al Rashid, Jafar al Barmaki, and Mansur in this story, taking an active part. Unlike the previous descriptions of Harun al-Rashid, however, while the threats against Jafar are still present and frequently used, evidenced by the numerous times he continually threatens him at various parts in this night, these threats are now often tempered with joviality and humor, which may lead one to believe that these threats were often used as playful banter between the two. The reaction that Jafar has when faced with these threats, however, does not make it seem like he knew that they were simply how Harun al-Rashid joked with him, deepening the mystery of what exactly is the storyteller attempting to show. We once again encounter the character of the fisherman, although the role Karim the fisherman plays is small, the presence of his character, including the description of his poverty and his clothing, may have been an effort to show that not all characters are from similar social situation and classes. In the next episode, we will return once again to another episode of The Tales from Central Asia. Auzubillah minashaitan nirajim bismillahirrahman nirrahim In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Praise be to God, the beneficent King, the creator of the universe, who has raised the heavens without pillars, and spread out the earth as a bed. And blessings and peace be upon the Lord of Apostles, our Lord and Master Muhammad Wasallam, and his family. Blessings and peace, enduring and constant unto the day of judgment. Of a verity, the doings of the ancients become a lesson to those that follow after, so that men look upon the admonitory events that have happened to others and take warning and come to the knowledge of what befell bygone peoples, and are restrained thereby. So glory be to him who hath appointed the things that have been done aforetime for an example to those that have come after. And of these admonitory instances are the histories called the Thousand and One Nights, with all their store of illustrious fables and relations. Sherzad continued. O oh, my master, he answered, we are strangers and a tear gushed from his eye. The Sheikh Ibrahim then said to him, O my son, know that the Prophet, Allah bless and save him, 
hath enjoyed generosity to the stranger, wilt thou not arise, O my son, and enter the garden, and divert thyself in it, that thy heart may be dilated? O my master, said Nuruddin, to whom doth this garden belong? The sheikh answered, O my son, this garden I inherited from my family, and his design in saying this was only that they might feel themselves at ease and enter the garden. And when Nuruddin heard his words, he thanked him and arose together with his slave, and the sheikh Ibrahim, preceding them, they entered the garden. The gate was arched, and over it were vines of grapes of different colors, the red like rubies, and the black like ebony. They entered a bower, and found within it fruits growing in clusters and singly, and the birds were warbling their various notes upon the branches. The nightingale was pouring forth its melodious sounds, and the turtle dove filled the place with its cooing and the blackbird in its singing, resembling a human being, and the ring-dove, a person exhilarated by wine. The fruits upon the trees, comprising every description that was good to eat, had ripened, and there were two of each kind. There were the camphor apricot, and the almond apricot, and the apricot of Khorasan, the plum of a color like the complexion of beauties, the cherry delighting the sense of every man, and kept the teeth from turning yellow, the red, the white, and the green fig of the most beautiful colors, and flowers like pearls and coral, the rose whose redness put to shame the cheeks of the lovely, the violet like sulphur in contract with fire, has been put at night, the myrtle, the gilly flower, the lavender, and the anemone, and their leaves be sprangled with the tears of the clouds. The chamomile smiled, displaying its teeth, and the narcissus looked at the rose with its black eyes. The citrons resembled round cups, and the lemons like nuts of gold. The limes were like bullets of gold. The ground was carpeted with flowers of every color, and the place beamed with the charms of spring, and its splendor added radiance to the garden. The river murmured by while the birds sang, and the wind whistled among the trees. The season was temperate, and the zephyr was languishing. The sheikh Ibrahim conducted them into an elevated saloon, and they were charmed with its beauty and the extraordinary elegances which it displayed, and at the candles in the window, and seated themselves in one of the windows, and Nuruddin, reflecting upon his past entertainments, exclaimed, By Allah, this place is most delightful, this is a pleasant place. It hath reminded me of past events, and quenched in me an anguish like the fire of the Gada. The Sheikh Ibrahim then brought to them some food, and they ate to satisfaction, and washed their hands, and Nuruddin, seating himself again in one of the windows, called to his slave, and she came to him, and they sat gazing at the trees laden with all kinds of fruits, after which Nuruddin looked towards the sheikh and said to him, O sheikh Ibrahim, hast thou not any beverage? For people drink after eating. So the sheikh brought him some sweet and cold water, but Nuruddin said, This is not the beverage I desire. Dost thou want wine? asked the sheikh. Yes, answered Nuruddin. The sheikh exclaimed, I seek refuge with Allah from it. Warily, for thirteen years, I have done nothing of the kind, for the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, God bless and save him, cursed its drinker, and its presser, and its carrier. Hear from me two words, said Nuruddin. The sheikh replied, Say what thou wilt. So he said, If thou be neither the presser of wine, nor its drinker, nor its carrier, will aught of the curse fall upon thee? The sheikh answered, No. If this damned donkey is cursed, will the curse hurt you at all? No, replied Sheikh Ibrahim. Then take this piece of gold, rejoined Nuruddin, and these two pieces of silver, 
and mount the ass, and halt at a distance from the place, and whatsoever man thou findest to buy it, call to him, and say to him, Take these two pieces of silver, and with this piece of gold buy some wine, and place it upon the ass, so in this case thou wilt be neither the carrier, nor the presser, nor the buyer, and nothing will befell thee of that which befalleth the rest. The Sheikh Ibrahim, after laughing at his words, replied, By Allah, I have never seen one more witty than thou, nor heard speech more sweet. And Nuruddin said to him, We have become dependent upon thee, and thou hast nothing to do but to comply with our wishes. Bring us therefore all that we require. O oh, my son, said the Sheikh, my buttery here is before thee, and it was the storeroom furnished for the prince of the faithful. Enter it then, and take from it what thou wilt, for it containeth more than thou desirest. So Nuruddin entered the storeroom, and beheld in it vessels of gold and silver and crystal, adorned with a variety of jewels. He was pleased by what he saw to the point of astonishment and he took out such of them as he desired, and poured the wine into the vessels of earthenware and bottles of glass, and he and the damsel began to drink, astonished at the beauty of the things which they beheld. The Sheikh Ibrahim then brought to them sweet-scented flowers, and seated himself at a distance from them, and they continued drinking in a state of utmost delight until the wine took effect upon them, and their cheeks reddened, and their eyes wantoned like those of the gazelle, they exchanged amorous glances, and their hair hung down as their color changed. Whereupon Sheikh Ibrahim said, What aileth me that I am sitting at a distance from them? Why should I not sit by them? And when shall I be in the company of such as these two, who are like two moons? He then advanced and seated himself at the edge of the raised portion of the floor, and Nuruddin said to him, O oh my master, by my life I conjure thee to approach and join us. So he went to them, and Nuruddin filled a cup, and looking at the sheikh said to him, Drink, that thou mayest know how delicious is its flavor. But the sheikh Ibrahim exclaimed, I seek refuge with Allah. Wearily, for thirteen years I have done nothing of the kind. And Nuruddin, feigning to pay no attention to him, drank the cup and threw himself upon the ground, pretending that intoxication had overcome him. Upon this, Anas al Jalis looked toward the Sheikh and said to him, O Sheikh Ibrahim, see how this man hath treated me. O my mistress, said he, what aileth him? She rejoined, Always doth he treat me thus. He drinketh a while, and then sleepeth, and I remain alone, and find no one to keep me company over my cup. If I drink, who will serve me? If I sing, who will hear me? The sheikh, moved with tenderness and affection for her, by her words replied, It is not proper that a cup companion be thus. The damsel then filled a cup, and looking at the sheikh Ibrahim, said to him, I conjure thee by my life that thou take it and drink it, reject it not, but accept it and refresh my heart. So he stretched forth his hand and took the cup and drank it, and she filled for him a second time and handed it to him, saying, O my master, this remaineth for thee. He replied, By Allah, I cannot drink it. That which I have drunk is enough for me. But she said, By Allah, it is indispensable and he took the cup and drank it. She then gave him the third, and he took it, and was about to drink it, when lo, Nuruddin raised himself. Night 37 Morning now dawned, and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the thirty-seventh night, she continued. I have heard, O auspicious Shahanshah, that Nuruddin sat up and said, and said to him, O Sheikh Ibrahim, what is this? Did I not conjure thee a while ago, and thou refusest, and saidest, Wearily, for thirteen years I have not done it? The Sheikh Ibrahim, touched with shame, replied, 
By Allah, I am not in fault, for she pressed me. And Nuruddin laughed, and they resumed their carousal, and the damsel, turning her eyes towards her master, said to him, O my master, drink thou, and do not urge the Sheikh Ibrahim, that I may divert thee with the sight of him. So she began to fill and to hand to her master, and her master filled and gave it to her, and thus they continued to do after a time, till at length the Sheikh Ibrahim looked towards them and said, What meaneth this, and what sort of carousal is this? Wherefore do ye not give me to drink, since I have become your cup companion? At this they both laughed until they became almost senseless, and then drank and gave him to drink, and they continued until the expiration of a third of the night, when the damsel said, O Sheikh Ibrahim, with thy permission, shall I rise and light one of the candles which are arranged here? Rise, he answered, but light no more than one candle. But she sprang upon her feet, and beginning with the first candle, proceeded until she had lighted eighty. She then sat down again, and presently Nuruddin said, O Sheikh Ibrahim, in what favour am I held with thee? Wilt thou not allow me to light one of these lamps? The Sheikh answered, Arise and light one lamp, and be not thou also troublesome. So he arose, and beginning with the first lamp, lighted all the eighty, and the saloon seemed to dance. And after this the Sheikh Ibrahim, overcome with intoxication, said to them, Ye are more frolicsome than I. And he sprang upon his feet, and opened all the windows, and sat down with them again. And they continued carousing and reciting verses, and the place rang with their merriment while the house was filled with flickering light. Now Allah, the all-seeing and all-knowing, who hath appointed a cause to every event, had decreed that the Khalifa should be sitting that night at one of the windows looking towards the Tigris by moonlight, and he looked in that direction and saw the light of lamps and the candles reflected in the river and turning his eyes up towards the palace in the garden, he beheld it beaming with those candles and lamps, and exclaimed, Bring hither to me Jafar al-Barmaki. In the twinkling of an eye, Jafar stood before the prince of the faithful, and the Khalifa said to him, O dog of the viziers, dost thou serve me, and not acquaint me with what happeneth in the city of Baghdad? Dog of a vizier, are you taking the city of Baghdad from me without saying? What, asked Jafar, is the occasion of these words? The Khalifa answered, If the city of Baghdad were not taken from me, the palace of diversion were not enlivened with the light of the lamps and candles, and its windows were not opened. Woe to thee! Who could do these things unless the office of the Khalifa were taken from me? Who, said Jafar, the muscles of his side quivering from fear, informed thee that the lamps and candles were lighted in the palace of diversion, and that its windows were opened? The Khalifa replied, Advance hither to me and look. So Jafar approached the Khalifa, and looking towards the garden, beheld the palace as if it were a flame of fire, its light surpassing that of the moon. He desired, therefore, to make an excuse for the Sheikh Ibrahim, the superintendent, thinking from what he beheld that the event might have occurred through his permission. And accordingly he said, O Prince of the Faithful, the Sheikh Ibrahim last week said to me, O my master Jafar, I am desirous of entertaining my children during my life and the life of the prince of the faithful and what said i is thy design in saying this he answered it is my wish that thou wouldest obtain for me permission from the khalifa that i may celebrate the circumcision of my sons in the palace so i said do what thou wilt with respect to the entertainment of thy sons and if allah will I shall have an interview with the Khalifa, and will acquaint him with it. And he left me thus, and I forgot to acquaint thee. 
O Jafar, said the Khalifa, thou wast guilty of one offence against me, and then thine offence became two, for thou hast erred in two points. The first, thy not acquainting me with this affair, and the second, of thy not accomplishing the desire of the Sheikh Ibrahim, for he did not come to thee and address thee with these words, but to hint a request for some money, by the aid of which to effect his design, and thou neither gavest him anything, nor acquainted me that I might give him. O Prince of the Faithful, replied Jafar, I forgot. The Khalifa then said, By my fathers and forefathers, I will not pass the remainder of my night but with him, for he is a good and just man, who frequenteth the sheikhs and fakirs, and attendeth to the poor, and favoureth the indigent, and I imagine all his acquaintances are with him this night, so I must repair to him, perhaps one of them may offer up for us a prayer productive of good to us in this world, and the next, and probably some advantage, may accrue to him from my presence, and he will receive pleasure from this, together with his friends. O Prince of the Faithful, replied Jafar, the greater part of the night hath passed, and they are now about to disperse. But the Khalifa said, We must go to them. And Jafar was silent, and was perplexed in his mind, not knowing what to do. So the Khalifa rose upon his feet, and Jafar rose and preceded him, and Mansur the eunuch went with him. The three walked on reflecting and departing from the palace, proceeded through the streets in the attire of merchants, until they arrived at the gate of the garden, and the Khalifa approaching it, found it open, and he was surprised, and said, See, O Jafar, how the Sheikh Ibrahim hath left the gate open until this hour, which is not his usual custom. They then entered, and came to the end of the garden, where they stopped beneath the palace, and the Khalifa said, O Jafar, I desire to take a view of them secretly before I go up to them. I want to spy out the ground, said the Khalifa, before I show myself to them, that I may see how the sheikhs are occupied in the dispensing of their blessings and the employment of their miraculous powers, for they have qualities which distinguish them both in their private retirements and in their public exercises. And now we hear not their voices, nor discover any indication of their presence, for up till now I have not heard any sound from them, or from any fakir reciting the name of Allah. Having thus said, he looked around, and seeing a tall walnut tree, said, O Jafar, I would climb this tree, for its branches are near to the windows, and look at them and accordingly he ascended the tree, and climbed from branch to branch, until he came to that which was opposite to one of the windows, and there he sat, and looking in through this window of the palace, beheld a damsel and a young man, like two moons, extolled be the perfection of Allah who created them, and he saw the Sheikh Ibrahim sitting with a cup in his hand, and saying, O mistress of beauties, drinking unaccompanied by merry sounds is not pleasant. Hast thou not heard the saying of the poet? Circulate it in the large cup and in the small, and receive it from the hand of the shining moon. And drink not without merry sounds, for I have observed that horses drink to the sound of whistling. I have heard that the poet says, Pass round the glasses great and small, Take them from the hand of a resplendent moon, but do not drink without music. A horse will only drink when whistled to. When the Khalifa witnessed this conduct of the Sheikh Ibrahim, the wane of anger swelled between his eyes, and he descended and said, O Jafar, I have never seen anything of the miraculous performances of the just, such as I have beheld this night. Ascend therefore thyself also into this tree and look lest the blessings of the just escape thee. I have never seen pious men behaving like this, so climb the tree yourself and have a look, in case ye lose the benefit of the blessings of the pious. 
On hearing the words of the Prince of the Faithful, Jafar was perplexed at his situation, and he climbed up into the tree and looked, and saw Nuruddin and the Sheikh Ibrahim, and the damsel, and the Sheikh Ibrahim had the cup in his hand. As soon as he beheld this, he made sure of destruction, and he descended and stood before the Prince of the Faithful and the Khalifa, said, O Jafar, praise be to Allah, who hath made us to be of the number of those who followed the external ordinances of the holy law, and averted from us the sin of disguising ourselves by the practice of hypocrisy. Praise be to Allah, who has placed us among those who follow the literal meaning of the revealed law. But Jafar was unable to reply from his excessive confusion. The Khalifa looked towards him and said, Who can have brought these persons hither and admitted them into my palace, but the like of this young man and this damsel in beauty and loveliness and symmetry of form mine eye hath never beheld? Jafar, now convinced a hope that the Khalifa might be propriated, replied, Thou hast spoken truly, O Prince of the Faithful. And the Khalifa said, O Jafar, climb up with us upon this branch, which is opposite to them, that we may amuse ourselves by observing them. So they both climbed up into the tree, and looked at them, and heard the Sheikh Ibrahim say, O my mistress, I have relinquished decorum by the drinking of wine, but the pleasure of this is not complete without the melodious sounds of stringed instruments. O Sheikh Ibrahim, replied Anas al-Jalis, by Allah, if we had any musical instrument, our happiness were perfect. And when the Sheikh Ibrahim heard her words, he rose upon his feet. The Khalifa said to Jafar, What may he be going to do? Jafar replied, I know not. And the Sheikh Ibrahim went away and returned with a lute. And the Khalifa, looking attentively at it, saw that it was the lute of Isaac, the cup companion, and said, by Allah, if this damsel sing not well, I will crucify you all. But if she sings well, I will pardon them and crucify thee. So Jafar said, O Allah, let her not sing well. Why? Ask the Khalifa. That thou mayest crucify all of us, answered Jafar, and then we shall cheer one another by conversation. And the Khalifa laughed, and the damsel took the lute, and tuned its strings, and played upon it in a manner that would melt iron, and inspire an idiot with intellect. Then she recited the lines, You who bring poor lovers aid, the fires of love and longing consume me. Whatever you may do, this I deserve. You are my refuge. Do not laugh at my misfortune. I am abashed and wretched. Do what you want with me. It is no cause for pride to kill me in your camp. My fear is that you sin by killing me. After which she sang with such sweetness that the Khalifa exclaimed, O Jafar, never in my life have I heard so enchanting a voice as this. Perhaps, said Jafar, the anger of the Khalifa hath departed from him. Yea, he answered, it hath departed. He then descended with Jafar from the tree, and looking towards him said, I am desirous of going up to them, to sit with them, and to hear the damsel sing before me. O Prince of the Faithful, replied Jafar, if thou go up to them, probably they will be troubled by thy presence, and as to the Sheikh Ibrahim, he will assuredly die of fear. The Khalifa therefore said, O Jafar, thou must acquaint me with some stratagems, by means of which I may learn the truth of the affair without their knowing that I have discovered them. And he, Jafar, walked towards the Tigris, reflecting upon this matter, and lo, a fisherman stood beneath the window of the palace, and he threw his net, hoping to catch something by means of which to obtain his sustenance. Now the Khalifa had on a former occasion called to the Sheikh Ibrahim, and said to him, What was that noise that I heard beneath the windows of the palace? And he answered, The voices of the fishermen who are fishing. Go, he said, go down and forbid them from coming to this place. They were therefore forbidden to come hither, but this night there came a fisherman named Karim, and seeing the garden gate open, he said within himself, 
this is a time of inadvertence, and perhaps I may catch some fish on this occasion. So he took his net and threw it into the river, and then recited some verses contrasting the condition of the poor fisherman toiling throughout the night with that of the lord of the palace, who, awakening from a pleasant slumber, findeth the fawn in his possession, and as soon as he finished his recitation, lo, the khalifa unattended stood at his head. The khalifa knew him, and exclaimed, O Karim, and this fisherman, hearing him call him by his name, turned towards him, and when he beheld the khalifa, the muscles of his side quivered, and he said, by Allah, O Prince of the Faithful, I did not this in mockery of the mandate, but poverty and the wants of my family impelled me to the act of which thou art witness. The Khalifa replied, Throw thy net for my luck. And the fisherman advanced, rejoicing exceedingly, and cast the net, and having waited until it had attained its limit and became steady at the bottom, drew it in again and there came up in it a variety of fish that could not be numbered. The Khalifa was delighted at this, and said, O Karim, strip off thy clothes, and he did so. He was clad in a jubbeh, in which were a hundred patches of coarse woolen stuff, containing vermin of the most abdominable kind, and among them fleas and long-tailed lice, in such number that he might almost have been transported by their means over the face of the earth, and he took from his head a turban, which for three years he had never unwound, but when he happened to find a piece of rag, he twisted it around it, and when he had taken off the jubbe and the turban, the khalifa pulled off from his own person two wests of silk of Alexandria, and Baalbek, and a Melwata, and a Farajie, and said to the fishermen, Take these and put them on. The Khalifa then put on himself the fisherman's jubbe and turban, and having drawn a litham over his face, said to the fisherman, Go about thy business. And he kissed the feet of the Khalifa and thanked him, reciting these two verses. Thou hast granted me favors beyond my power to acknowledge, and completely satisfied all my wants. I will thank thee therefore as long as I live, and when I die, my bones will thank thee in their grave. And started to recite. You have granted favors for which I proclaim my gratitude, and you have aided me in all affairs of mine. Throughout my life I shall give you my thanks, and if I die, my bones will proclaim their gratitude from my grave. But scarcely had he finished his verses, when the wormen overran the person of the Khalifa, and he began to seize them with his right hand and left from his neck, and to throw them down, and he exclaimed, O fisherman, woe to thee! What are these abundant wormen in this jubbe? O my lord, he answered, at present they torment thee, but when a week shall have passed over thee, thou wilt not feel them, nor think of them. The Khalifa laughed and said to him, How can I suffer this jubbe to remain upon me? The fisherman replied, I wish to tell thee something, but I am ashamed, through my awe of the Khalifa. In part, said the Khalifa, what thou hast to tell me. So he said to him, It hath occurred to my mind, O prince of the faithful, that thou desirest to learn the art of fishing, in order that thou mayest be master of a trade that may profit thee, and if such be thy desire, this jubbe is suitable to thee. And the Khalifa laughed at his words. The fisherman then went his way, and the Khalifa took the basket of fish, and having put upon it a little grass, went with it to Jafar, and stood before him, and Jafar, thinking that he was Karim the fisherman, feared for him, and said, O Karim, what broughteth thee hither, save thyself by flight, for the Khalifa is here this night. And when the Khalifa heard the words of Jafar, he laughed until he fell down upon his back. So Jafar said, Perhaps thou art our lord, the prince of the faithful. Yes, O Jafar, answered the Khalifa, and thou art my vizier, and I came with thee hither, and thou knowest me not. How then should the Sheikh Ibrahim know me when he is drunk? Remain where thou art until I return to thee. 
Jafar replied, I hear and obey, and the Khalifa advanced to the door of the palace and knocked. The Sheikh Ibrahim rose therefore and said, Who is at the door? He answered, I, O Sheikh Ibrahim. The Sheikh said, Who art thou? And the Khalifa answered, I am Karim the fisherman. I heard that there were guests with thee, and therefore brought thee some fish, for it is excellent. Now Nuruddin and the damsel were both fond of fish, and when they heard the mention of it, they rejoiced exceedingly, and said, O my master, open to him, and let him come in to us with the fish which he hath brought. So the Sheikh Ibrahim opened the door, and the Khalifa, in his fisherman's disguise, entered and began by salutation, and the Sheikh Ibrahim said to him, Welcome to the robber, the thief, the gambler. Come hither and show us the fish which thou hath brought. He therefore showed it to him, and lo, it was alive and moving, and the damsel exclaimed, By Allah, O my master, this fish is excellent. I wish it were fried. By Allah, said the Sheikh Ibrahim, thou hast spoken truth. Then addressing the Khalifa, he said, O fisherman, I wish thou hadst brought this fish fried. Arise and fry it for us, and bring it. On the head be thy command, replied the Khalifa, I will fry it and bring it. Be quick, said they, in doing it. The Khalifa therefore rose and ran back to Jafar and said, O Jafar, they want the fish fried. O Prince of the Faithful, replied he, give it to me and I will fry it. But the Khalifa said, By the tombs of my ancestors, none shall fry it but myself. With my own hand I will do it. He then repaired to the hut of the superintendent, and searching there found in it everything that he required, the frying pan and even the salt, including saffron, thyme, and other seasonings, and wild marjoram and other things. So he approached the fireplace and put on the frying pan and fried it nicely, and when it was done, he put it upon a banana leaf, and having taken from the garden some limes, some windfalls, and some lemons, he went up with the fish and placed it before them. The young man, therefore, and the damsel, and the Sheikh Ibrahim advanced and ate, and when they had finished, they washed their hands, and Nuruddin said, By Allah, O fisherman, thou hast done us a kindness this night. Then putting his hand into his pocket, he took forth for him three pieces of gold, of those which Sanjar had presented to him when he was setting forth on his journey, and said, O fisherman, excuse me, for, by Allah, if I had known thee before the events that have lately happened to me, I would have extracted the bitterness of poverty from thy heart, but take this as accordant with my present circumstances. So saying, he threw the pieces of gold to the Khalifa, who took them and kissed them, and put them in his pocket. The object of the Khalifa in doing this was only that he might hear the damsel sing. So he said to him, Thou hast treated me with beneficence, and abundantly recompensed me, but I beg of thy unbounded indulgence, that this damsel may sing an air, that I may hear her. Nuruddin therefore said, O oh, Anis al Jalis, she replied, Yes. By my life, said he, sing to us something for the gratification of this fisherman, for he desireth to hear thee. And when she heard what her master said, she took the lute and tried it with her fingers, after she had twisted its pegs and sang to it these two verses. The fingers of many a fawn-like damsel have played upon the lute, and the soul hath been ravished by the touch. She hath made the deaf to hear her songs, and the dumb hath exclaimed, Thou hast excelled in thy singing. There is many a girl whose fingers have held the lute, stealing away men's souls as she touched the strings. As she sang, her singing cured the deaf, while the dumb cried out, Well done indeed. Then she played again in an extraordinary manner, so as to charm the minds of her hearers, and sang the following couplet. We are honoured by your visiting our abode, and your splendour hath dispelled the darkness of the moonless night. It is therefore incumbent upon me to perfume my dwelling with musk and rose-water and camphor. We are honoured 
that you have visited our land, and your splendor has driven away our gloomy dark. It is only right that I should perfume my house with camphor, musk, and rose water. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on coffee. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please click on the link available on our many social media platforms or email us. Why not donate to our coffee to show your appreciation? Every bit helps and we thank you for your continued support. We love that our listeners love listening to us. Welcome to the vocabulary section for this episode. First, let's look at some of the terms that were used in this episode. Bower, a pleasant shady place under trees or climbing plants in a garden or wood. Warbling of a bird, singing softly and with a succession of constantly changing notes. Almond apricot, Almond apricots are called that because the kernels are as sweet as almonds. Anemone, genius of flowering plants in the buttercup family, native to the temperate and subtropical regions of all continents except Australia, New Zealand, and Antarctica. Gillyflower, also known as the spice called clove, has fragrant flowers. Myrtle, evergreen shrubs or small tree star-like flower with five petals has fruit which is shaped as a round berry gada arabic feminine given name refers to women who are attractive graceful and active tender and enchanting giving and enlightening buttery Large cellar room in which food and drink were stored for the provision of strangers and passing guests. Jubbe, a long outer coat with sleeves nearly reaching to the waist. Balbek, a city in present-day Lebanon. Melwata, dress of costly material. Farajie, a long sleeve robe worn by the learned. Litham a Bedouin muffler made by the end of the head kerchief. Marjoram, aromatic southern European plant of the mint family whose leaves are used as a culinary herb. Camphor, white volatile crystalline substance with an aromatic smell and bitter taste occurring in certain essential oils. Fakir, a medicant or dervish. Now let's look at some of the vocabulary used in this episode. Divert. Cause someone or something to change course or turn from one direction to another. Dilated. Make or become wider, larger, or more open. Design. Purpose, planning, or intention that exists or is thought to exist behind the actions, fact, or material object. Or, to plan something with a specific purpose or intention in mind. Melodious. Producing or having a pleasant tune or tuneful. Be sprangled. Dot or sprinkle with brilliantly sparkling or glittering objects. Languishing. Failing to make progress or be successful. Rejoined. To join together again or to reunite. Wanted. To behave in a sexually unrestrained way. Alif. Archaic, third person, singular, simple, present, indicative form of ale. Ale means to feel ill or have pain. Carousal. The act of celebrating and enjoying yourself and speaking and laughing loudly with other people. Frolicsome, lively and playful. Acquaint, make someone aware of or familiar with. Quivering, trembling or shaking with slight rapid motion. Desirous, having or characterized by having desire. Indigent, poor or needy. Retirements, seclusion or a secluded or private place. Extolled, praise enthusiastically. Ordinances, an authoritative order or decree or a prescribed religious rite. Averted. Turn away one's eyes or thoughts or prevent or ward off an undesirable occurrence. Propiated. Win or regain the favor of God or a person or spirit by doing something that pleases them. 
decorum, behaving in keeping with good taste and propriety. Stratagem, a plan or scheme, especially one used to outwit an opponent or achieve an end. Inadvertence, lack of attention, heedlessness, or an instance, or an effect of being inadvertent. Fawn, give a servile display of exaggerated flattery or affection, typically in order to gain favor or advantage. Accordant, agreeing or compatible. Gratification, pleasure especially when gained from the satisfaction of a desire or a source of pleasure. This episode has been written, edited, and produced by Saf Big. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and or night. And may the journeys on which you are set upon be fruitful. Thank you for listening.